repository certification in practice. Thank you, Tom. So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Witt from Purdue University. And if you were at the reception last night and you were dancing, I apologize if I knocked you over. That's the first time I've been to a Kaylee. And so uh, and I, I learned about it very good. It was a lot of fun. So our topic this morning is ISO 16363, Trustworthy Digital Repositories. This is uh, an ISO specification that was published in February. It's based on work uh, related to TRAC, T-R-A-C, the Trustworthy Repository Audit Checklist. And the basic concept is if a, a user is going to submit their content to your repository or download reposit repository content, how can, they, how, can they, how can they trust that that content is, uh, is being stewarded properly, that it will be available in the future, that it is the, the content that they've requested, uh, and, and these kinds of things. And so the panel that we've uh, assembled is, uh, uh, represents three perspectives in terms of the, the process of an audit. Uh, we have Matthew Kroll from Purdue University, who represents the Purdue University Repository, our institutional data repository, which is currently preparing for an ISO 16363 audit or a track audit right now. And then we have David Miner from the University of, Califor University of California at San Diego, uh, representing the Chronopolis Project, who has recently undergone a track certification. And so he can present the perspective of someone who's recently gone through the process. And then third, we have Bernie Riley, who is the president of the Center for Research Libraries. And Bernie represents the perspective of an auditing agency. So he can talk about the audit process, you know, and, and what, they, what they look for and how they perform the audits. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Matthew. Thank you, Michael. Um, everybody hear me okay? All right, great. So good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Kroll. I'm a graduate research assistant. I work with Michael Witt. Uh, at the Purdue University Research Libraries. Specifically, I've been helping prepare the Purdue University Research Repository, or PER, for trustworthy certification. A brief introduction to PER. PER is a comprehensive solution for data management with a commitment to cooperative, comprehensive, and progressive preservation practices. From providing an online collaborative workspace and data sharing platform, to, pub to potential publication and archiving of data sets to user access, PER supports the digital data preservation needs of Purdue University researchers and their colleagues and collaborators. Itself a collaborative project involving several different departments on campus. In the fall of 2011, we officially began preparing ourselves for trustworthy certification. So today, oh, I guess I should be. <laughs> There's my title slide <laughs> uh, and a per screenshot, sorry. Um, so today, really, I'd like to talk about three things. I just want to give you some background to what I will call ISO 16363. Uh, I should say this is actually the recommended practice audit and certification of trustworthy digital repositories. Um, but for brevity's sake, I'll refer to it as 16363. But this is the user's guide. This is what we're using to prepare ourselves. So I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction to that. I'd like to give one interpretation at least of trustworthiness in this context. And then I'd also like to share a self-assessment tool that we used at PER to help prepare ourselves for this audit. So a necessary and valid question to ask ourselves is what is trustworthiness in this context? Um, going back now about a decade, there's been several documents that have attempted to define this concept, um, one of which I have up here on a slide. Admittedly, and this is not to be critical of these early attempts to define trustworthiness, but it's a very vague concept uh, and one that certainly needs to grow as the digital preservation environment and community grows. Um, what I would like to do is offer three attributes that I think are of vital importance, um, three concepts that I think you can employ if you're planning on preparing for such an audit. They are integrity, sustainability, and support. Now these three concepts, these terms, these attributes, they appear throughout the literature. Um, they're prominent throughout the literature, and in fact, say something like sustainability is a word that I think we've heard in many of the panels throughout the week. What I think is important is to try and map these three attributes 
across your organization. And when we look at ISO 16363, the three sections of criteria, it's important to try and map these three attributes across those three sections. So to give an example, integrity um, might involve things like your organization has financial support and adequate staff. And then there's integrity of, say, the digital objects, which might be that you run fixity checks or you have certain procedures and practices that ensure that transformation or migration will go successfully. Um, if you look at sort of the hardware, the software, the infrastructure, the security of your organization, integrity might be something as simple as you have an off-site backup that's not in the immediate geographical location. Um, our first panel mentioned some of that today, the importance to have off-site backups not in the same geographical area. Um, so then you think about something like support. This isn't just financial support or support of your designated community, but I also think this means that your repository can support its own staff in terms of staff development and being able to grow with the changes in the digital preservation environment. So again, obviously these things are open to interpretation. These aren't the only three attributes that appear in the literature or that are important. Um, but I think this gives a good idea of three attributes which you can try and work towards and map across your organization and approach ISO 16363 both holistically but also on a per criterion basis using these attributes as a guide. So a bit on ISO 16363, um, it's five sections, the document, uh, some introductory material, sets out some of the terminology, but what will be of most importance for you if you are planning on a trustworthy certification are the three sections of criteria. They are organizational infrastructure, digital object management, and lastly, infrastructure and security risk management. Um, to my count, there's about 109 criteria in all. Um, the way they work is that there are primary metrics, what I would call a primary metric and a submetric. So a primary metric will lay out a particular criteria, criterion, and then the submetrics will be that criterion parsed out um, along the way. One thing I did want to note is that it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. And what I mean here is that one criterion may require more than one practice or document to go towards proving trustworthiness. Um, at the same time, one document may in fact go towards at least partially proving conformity to trustworthiness and the audit um, across many different criteria, in fact, even through the different sections. I should say that the criteria, the criteria, they range from things that are fairly straightforward, such as your repository has a mission statement, um, to things that involve escrow arrangements, uh, contingency plans in the case of a disaster, things of this nature. Now, how might you use these to start to prepare your organization? Michael Witt developed and I helped implement what we call a gap analysis, a self-assessment tool. And it's a basic four-point metric of our own in which one was what we were shooting for. Um, and essentially what we did was we read through the entire document, Michael and I graded ourselves. And two things I'd like to share with you about this process that I think were really beneficial. One, we brought in an expert from different aspects of the organization who had expertise in different aspects of this organization. And we did what I'd like to call a pop quiz. We brought them in, we had our ideas of where we were with these criteria. And we brought in someone from outside and simply had them read them and give sort of a gut instinct response to where they felt like we were. Um, this had great benefit. One, I think that not necessarily being prepared, you aren't overrating yourself. I think you give a very honest, um, immediate response to this sort of approach. And secondly, and what I think was really beneficial for our organization, is doing it this way, as PER was developing and simultaneously preparing for a trustworthy certification, it created a very nice, what I might call an organic reciprocal process, where not only were we improving our development, improving our services, finalizing services that we felt like were very close, 
but also we were gaining an understanding of what trustworthiness is and deepening our understanding of the digital preservation environment uh, along the way. Um, and that, I think, is it for me. So before I hand it over to David and Bernie, I'd just like to say thank you very much. I know it's a difficult morning to make it out after the Kaylee, but uh, thank you for joining us. So, hello. I'm actually going to sit so I can be closer to the microphone. Um, when I was growing up, my mom always said I mumbled too much. And she was right. So, um, so yeah, so I'm David Miner. I uh, work at UC San Diego and um, with a joint position. The library's there in the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is part of the university. Um, and I'm going to be talking in my role, uh, the very first one here, as the program manager for Chronopolis. And it's already been mentioned, but I'll just state it again. Uh, we have completed uh, the track process uh, actually this April, March or April. Uh, it was officially announced uh, and issued. Uh, and we did it uh, through the CRL um, organization, which Bernie will be talking about in just a moment. So I wanted to give you an overview of the kind of the processes that we did during the, uh, the effort, what we learned, some of the surprises, and where we see ourselves going forward. So just to give you the 30-second the thumbnail sketch of who we are, just in case you're not aware, uh, we are a preservation network, uh, and this kind of sounds familiar from what you've already heard today, based on uh, geographic replication. Three sites in Southern California, um, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado, and University of Maryland's Institute for Advanced Computing Studies. So we've got um, north, uh, or excuse me, east, west, east, west, and mountain in the United States. Um, so we managed to hit all of the natural disasters um, on time. Um, <laughs> which is uh, just a quick aside, two of those sites, since we've been up and running about five years, have had earthquakes. San Diego was not the one. So that's kind of interesting. Um, we were originally funded through the Library of Cong Congress's NDIP program, their National Preservation Program. Um, we were uh, funded by them for almost four years. Uh, a little over a year ago, we spun out into a, a fee-for-service organization, uh, and so a lot of their decision-making um, guided technology development, um, the kinds of things we did, who our customers were, what kind of needs we served, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other two things I wanted to mention here, and this sounds a little esoteric, but it's actually important for our audit. Um, each of our different nodes have different functions. Uh, so just as an example, the management and finances kind of functions are handled via UC San Diego and the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Um, and then all of the nodes are completely independent entities, both managerially, financially, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that posed kind of a lot of interesting logistical and, and kind of procedural questions um, for the auditors as they were looking at us. So uh, we heard kind of why Purdue and, and Pur are considering doing track. Uh, we had a lot of similar questions, but also some slightly different ones. Um, and I'll just go through these real quickly. One was obviously a validation of your work. We had gone through three and a half, four years of development uh, before we went into production, and we wanted to see, OK, well, did we do a good job? Did we do what people wanted? Uh, where are we in this process? Um, and I will say, being uh, perfectly um, uh, kind of open about this, this work was funded via the, our, our NDIP uh, grant. It was the last thing that we did for them. Uh, and so it was kind of an important follow-on for the development there. Um, we did want to be as honest as possible and know where we had gaps. Um, you know, wh what, did, where did, what kind of development did we need to do going forward? What had we maybe done poorly? Uh, we, we thought we did great, but you've got to always think you did great. Uh, and so what did other people think of that? Um, we really wanted to open it up and hear what other people in the community had to say. Um, not just the people that we'd worked with, not just the people that we'd served, but kind of people in the room, kind of, you know, throw it out here and say, okay, what are we doing, what could, be, what could we be doing, et cetera, et cetera. And again, to be perfectly honest, and it sounds somewhat cynical, but to get more business. Uh, we moved into a fee-for-service kind of environment. Um, having that kind of track imprimatur on there is a very good thing to be able to go out and say that you are and, and that you do. And, and that has actually come to pass for us. OK. Just some logistics on our process. And I think these vary from institution to institution, both because of the institution and because maybe of some schedules of auditors and things like that. Uh, we began kind of early, mid-summer of 2010. Uh, and it went right through to the end of 2012. Um, the final report was issued, uh, as I said, this spring. Uh, and just to kind of break that out a little more fully, um, 
the process that, that we did, uh, and we were actually kind of a, a, a previous generation to the document that the Purdue folks are looking at, just because we started earlier and there has been a, a generation of it, um, in that we did a self-audit. So we went through the whole big stack of 120-something questions and answered all of them the best that we thought and then hand them off to the auditing process. And then they went through and checked in and asked for follow-up, asked for more information, talked to our customers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we had a contact with our auditors, two people, um, actually three people, including Bernie, um, who came out and talked to us and did a site visit. We actually, other than that, we had no idea who the auditors were in the background who were evaluating the work. It's, it's a closed process in that sense. Um, we used a roughly about three full-time employees on our end during this process, a mix of kind of management types, people running the service. Uh, we pulled in our financial people, pulled in metadata librarians, people, those, people who do that, that kind of work. And then we, a lot of people we pulled in were our data center managers who aren't even paid by us in some sense, are part of our organization, but had to answer questions about you know, safety, security, all those kinds of things in the data center. Um, Auditors also went out and talked with our users, current, potential, and past customers and users, um, and to see what they thought about us. Uh, and in the end, we produced hundreds of pages of documentation. Um, some of these we had to write from scratch ourselves because we didn't necessarily have them. Uh, some of them were things like log files. Some of them were reports. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty thick packet of information. Uh, we did have a number of comments and issues raised by auditors, some surprising, some not. Um, some of the not surprising ones were actually the first two. Uh, they said we were very strong on technology, which was to be expected because that was our task when we were uh, supported by NDIP was to put forward strong technology uh, background and see how that worked. Um, as I mentioned, all of our sites have different functions and different um, ways of communicating and interacting with, with each other and had a lot of questions from the auditors about how that worked and what implications that, that had for preservation. Um, we were also less strong on business and long-term sustainability. Uh, to be honest, again, this is something we knew going in that we would have to address. I think in our community, it's the one thing that we all are kind of less strong on. Um, and so we had to uh, work on that. Um, we're still working on improving that, especially long-term planning and projections and things like that. Uh, and then the last one, which um, was a lot of discussion, was completely different, which was this notion of, are we even doing preservation? And it was kind of interesting at the end of the day, that was a very important question. Um, question earlier for DPN about file migration, normalization, things like that. That's something we don't do in Chronopolis very intentionally. Um, and there were auditors who raised kind of eyebrows and said, I'm not even sure you're doing preservation. And so it was kind of an interesting give and take about what that means and, and how to work through that. Uh, just a quick next step and future plans based on this. Um, as I said, we're already working to implement some of the recommendations, looking at new users, building new communities. We've already done that just in the last six months based on a lot of the feedback. Um, working with other networks, uh, you've already heard about DPN, DirCloud, some of the other things we're very excited to be a part of. Um, uh, it's not intended to be a one-time, once-and-done audit, obviously. Um, there's discussion, uh, or there's language in the audit of, you know, in two years, 24 months kind of time frame, going back and re-examining some of these things. So it, I don't think it's necessarily considered a re-audit in some sense, but it's, you know, want to recheck and make sure you haven't kind of fallen off the wagon. And, um, and we also have questions about uh, what if we change technologies? You know, what if we change things in the background that they approved or said were very strong? Um, what does that mean in terms of manage management changes? All these kinds of things. Um, and then lastly, uh, we definitely are hearing from people based on, um, on this process. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from people who are interested in learning more about us uh, based on the work that we've done. So that's basically it. Um, the next thing I do want to point out, I'll leave this up for just a quick second, is the last link that's to our website, um, or if you can just search Chronopolis Track, it'll come up. Uh, you will find our audit there. Uh, we also have the self-audit that we produced there. Uh, so you can do a compare and contrast and see if we lied or not uh, based on what the auditor said. Um, and I'm also happy to provide any kind of other information that people may want. So, thanks. Thanks, David. I'm Bernie Riley from Center for Research Libraries. We're a um, nonprofit corporation based in Chicago. We make a lot out of the fact that we're not Washington, D.C. 
um, and it, all the implications that go with that. We, we were actually, Chicago's only technically part of the United States. We have the uh, largest Polish-speaking population outside of Warsaw and one of the largest Mexican populations outside of Mexico City. So we're, we're just kind of uh, there in the, um, the center of the center of the universe. We, um, we, are, we do audits and certification of key repositories. We've been doing that for some time now. We are the publisher, uh, one of the publishers of the track checklist, the um, Trusted Repos Repositories Audit and Certification Checklist, which is actually a, a brilliant document. We're a publisher, not an author, so I can say that in all humility. But the, um, the document is the, are the main criteria for judging and evaluating the trustworthiness of a of a digital repository. Uh, we're also participating in the have participated in the development of the recent ISO standard 16363. We worked on the uh, development the standing committee to develop that and participated in the um, the test audits. But um, where do we get off doing all this? Uh, where do we get the standing to um, to do audits and certification and to help develop these standards? Uh, basically, we are an organization that began as a uh, as as a organization dedicated to uh, supporting advanced research in the humanities, sciences, and social sciences. We started out as a consortium of ten major research universities in the United States, it's essentially in the Midwestern United States, the University of Chicago. Northwestern University, University of Michigan, and several others in 1949. Uh, we've grown now to be about 267 uh, research universities in the United States, Canada, and the University of Hong Kong. So that's our, that's our community. We have done everything from uh, preserve important uh, manuscript and newspaper collections to uh, rescuing and preserving the files of the Khmer Rouge Santibal police that were left in Phnom Penh at the end of the killing fields uh, genocide in Cambodia. Uh, so under our, under our organizational umbrella, we ensure the long-term survival of important critical research information and to a large extent cultural heritage information. We are a um, Governed by the research community, we are, um, and our, the research communities are, are our stakeholders. Our $8 million a year in revenue and in operating funds come entirely, almost entirely from the research community. There's a certain amount of money that comes from private foundations and federal funding, but uh, largely we're beholden to the, um, to the research community. Our certification program, the purpose of it is to uh, protect the investments of our member institutions, of our stakeholder community, of the research universities, the colleges, the, um, and the researchers. The, um, we support, um, and again, this is supporting advanced um, research. We, are, um, we do audits of, of uh, repositories. We do analysis and evaluation of major repositories, not just repositories of scholarly information, but big commercial repositories as well. We're now looking at the ProQuest uh, digital repository and platform. We all do, do analysis of the landscape. We've done a couple of studies recently of the, um, the f on the future of electronic human rights documentation, those videos posted to YouTube from Tahrir Square and from Homs in Syria recently. That's important data, that's important documentary evidence that will need to be um, used in the future. We've, uh, we have a fair amount of experience. We've done uh, an audits and certified uh, Portico and Chronopolis. We're working now with the people from PER. Uh, we um, have also uh, are working with the Scholars Portal based at the University of Toronto, which is the major uh, digital repository for Canadian scholarly documentation. The, uh, the process was described by our, my colleagues uh, pretty much. It's essentially, the certification process essentially involves a self-analysis by the repository against, of their processes against the track checklist, then a um, examination and request for documentation from CRL guided by our certification advisory panel, which is a panel of representatives of the um, of our entire network, our entire stakeholder community, uh, and then a site visit, and then a report is posted to the web. We are um, 
continuing the track certification, ISO 16363, which is based largely on track, is now an official standard uh, that we're using, but the track certification will continue. We have um, assembled an enormous body of knowledge and information about how track works, yeah, about sample documents and templates, those kinds of things that will be useful for uh, not only for us but for the institutions that we're for the repositories that we're auditing and, and assessing. Our focus is on the humanities and social science data, uh, including, as I said, primary data and documentary evidence. We are um, continue to have the same mission as we had in 1949. We were founded, which is to ensure the long-term durability and persistence of important documentary information and uh, and evidence. So, I will. I do want to leave a couple of. Uh, a couple of minutes for questions, and I think uh, we'll move to those now. Michael? Thank, thank you, Bernie. Uh, we have uh, five minutes, Tom, for questions. Three. Three, three minutes for questions, so maybe, maybe one or two quick questions from the audience. Hi, I'm still Asga, and I'm still from the State University Library in Denmark. Um, one thing about uh, certification of a trustworthy digital repositories that's been bugging me when we've been trying to do it is um, the finance and sustainability of the organization aspects of it. Um, most of the checklist seems to be written to uh, address um, uh, one organization having one uh, repository, which is basically the entire thing that the organization is doing. But for most archives and national libraries, they are, in effect, uh, too big to fail. Um, so much of the sustainability, when you go to the management and say, um, we need to prove that we will have funding for, uh, for the next 10 years, is almost insulting to the managers. <laughs> because the, the, um, a national library is not, doesn't really, it's not losing funding <laughs> in the foreseeable future. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, one, one of the, um, purposes of certification. Certification is not just a pass-fail. It's, it's not a report card or a judgment. It's uh, essentially to identify the potential weaknesses, the potential flaws, the potential risks of a repository. So it's as important to know with a national repository, we know these things can't fail because they're parts. But one thing you, that comes out in the certification of, of that kind of a repository is um, the what, what the, um, the structure and the, the support that's given to the organization will, um, what impact that will have on the future of the repository, not just in terms of, of failing or not failing, but in terms of cost volatility, in terms of the decisions made about the management of the content, the decisions made about the scope of the, um, of the content preserved in the repository. So with the national institution, when you look at the stakeholders, you, when the first process of the audit, we look at the funding stream for that. Is it a line item in the national budget? If not, it's going to be subject to the ebb and flow of political interest. It's going to be subject to the um, economic forces in the particular economy, in the national economy. So if it's the national economy of Finland or Nor national economy of Norway, the national economy of Spain, these are things that come out in the audit. People who are relying on that repository will know, based on the audit, that these are these are the these are the factors that will govern the uh, future stability, but also the future direction of the repository. Okay, I'm afraid we've used up our time. Uh, Bernie, would you advance the Most slide one, please? So, for more information, we have a list of resources, and also our speakers will be here for the rest of the day at the conference today. Would you please join me in thanking them? Thanks. All right.